As I walked among the dead lunatics again, for the fifth time in six months, a familiar melancholy licked me with its bristly tongue. Surrounded by golden prairie, I stood there soaked and dejected, wondering, what was the point of chasing these shadows, seeking traces of what's been lost? At some point, I was convinced that something could be gained from excavating fragments left behind on the paths well trodden by the mat of times past. This something was elusive, however, and I seemed to have lost my footing. There is no place in the Americas where the dead don't scream in agony. There is no crook nor corner unsullied by madness, no green pastures of health and wellness untouched by disablement and debilitation. No fairy tale prairies pure and unsoiled by mass graves. But in the lunatic's graveyard, the objections of the past are impressed into the dirt. The earth itself is simultaneously house and cold numbered catalog of bodies bearing marks of sickness, of monstrosity, of capital, but never human life. Asylum graveyards are testaments to lives not worth living, lives whose value, value declared too late for the god forsaken to experience it, only appeared in death when the ghoulish grave robbers made them raw material for medical students or pathologists. My link to the dead is doubtless tied to the times I've lived undead before my cemetery summer. When I was 15, I was held for some time in a secure facility in upstate New York with other delinquent, risky, mad boys. One day, one of the boys had just finished confiding in the small group that he was experiencing crack withdrawals. He looked terrible, but he smiled in his sweaty, sickly way, and we all agreed not to mention it again. Like most of us, he did not improve. The air at night was ambient and thick with tears like radio static from all directions when the torrent of voices didn't drown them out. One day, one of the boys tried to cut his wrist with a dull stone. Unmoved, the world sank deeper into emptiness and shadow every day. From top to bottom, I was cut from whatever cosmic strings keeps people attuned to similar frequencies. I did not feel the blows from the stone I snuck onto my sleeping mat on the night I learned how hard it is to break your own legs. I had become a corpse in life, an experience shared by many lunatics, in what was the first of many periods of psychic putrefaction in my life. In all honesty, I struggle to recall a day on which the thought of my own death hasn't childishly demanded my attention. In the bright warmth of the summer months, my heart dwells in January. I've wallowed in thoughts of ending it all for months at a time, if not years. As the days have passed, I've become comfortable with my own inevitable end. On the best days, I wear my decay like a summer suit. I am a happy corpse, paying little mind to the worms picking clean my bones. And the undead, it seemed, were all around. Soon you will be released from all pain, all cancer, all depression. The time in the hospital will be just a memory. So said the pastor at my grandmother's deathbed in Wisconsin many summers later, where I waited for the end of a short but agonizing struggle. The death before me unexpectedly had to contend with the enormity of another past death unknown. Answers led only to more questions. What could possibly be said of years locked away? How many volts of course-correcting brutality trespassed that strange matter in her skull? Suddenly, at the moment of death, an intimate link and spark of potential appeared between her and me. But now she's truly dead, and all that remains is the mention of a past nobody is eager to discuss. Besides, any incidents recalled now are purely factual, and therefore of little import. Madness tends to dissolve at the end of a narrative, and from then, rears its head disingenuously in words disguise. But whatever commonality appeared in that room flashed and vanished in the same instant. Such is the predicament of the anguished and the mad, the inmates and the patients. The prospect of uniting at the rawest extremities, through wounds, in a commitment to alternative realities, through difference, or through shared knowledge of courtrooms, clinicians' offices, and intimate awareness of the intensity of four walls, through survival, slips away before it gains footing. 
The riotous carnival heralded by the symbols of unreason has yet to materialize beyond the level of unlikely friendships or the occasional psych ward or prison yard mutiny. The meek have yet to inherit the earth. The lunatics have yet to run the asylum. All that to say that I felt pulled towards the graveyards of lunatics by some irresistible magnetism. I've long suspected that much of what we call madness inexplicably includes an interminable pull towards the dead. The Islamic biographies of Ibn al-Jazi and Talmudic theology betray a secret bond of intimacy between madness and graveyards. In each, the lunatics can be identified by the fact that they go out alone at night to sleep in cemeteries. In the summer of 2019, I set out to see for myself what remained of the cemeteries of insane asylums throughout the Midwest, in Indiana, throughout Minnesota, and finally in Missouri. But perhaps in an only partly insane manner, joined as I was by friendly company. I began my journey with two friends in Indianapolis ground zero for the first eugenic studies and policies in the world, where the site of the former Central State Hospital has been reclaimed as the headquarters for a revitalization project spearheaded by well-meaning artists. Developers hope the villages at Central State can become an urban village that will help spur more retail. The old administration building and nurses' quarters are now home to artist lofts and Airbnb rooms, outfitted with a chic coffee shop and swimming pool to boot. The recreation hall plays host to fancy weddings and events for a couple grand an evening, and thanks to a generous invitation from the owners, the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department's mounted patrol unit has established their new stables for their horses. I wonder what this could be, is written above a mural on the side of one of the larger buildings. Thanks to developers, we don't have to wait to find out. A bar will soon be moving in. All the structures that would have been most familiar and painful for the patients have been reduced to rubble. We climbed a little pile of stones that used to be the massive hospital building called Seven Steeples for its imposing towers and looked out into the wide empty green. The dead house, however, remained standing, ominous and daunting, directly behind the old pathology building, now a museum, and not far from the powerhouse, soon to be a brewery, and the stables of the mounted patrol unit. On one moonlit night, we walked past the hostile barbed wires embracing the building tightly interwoven with waste and green brush, serving as evidence of neglect and time before deciding finally to go in. After carefully taking note to see if any equestrian officers were playing night watchman that evening, my friends and I rushed in through a gap in the fence. All was wreckage and ruin besides a foreboding iron door leading to what we presumed was the cadaver storage room. How could the patients have felt when this little necropolis caught their eye on an evening stroll, knowing that in all likelihood they would die there on those grounds and be carted along with the rest of the day's dead by trolley to be stashed in a refrigerated basement until the day the chief pathologist needed a corrupted brain to open up to curious students? Some might have said the lucky ones rested there, stockpiled under lock and key, safe at least from the ravenous grave robbers, colloquially called ghouls in the 19th century, looking to make coin procuring bodies for the new anatomy department at the local university. Once used, cut up, drained of stinking blood into a hole in the floor of the amphitheater, depleted bodies were spit back out again and deposited in the hospital cemetery. Unable to find it at first, I was bold enough to ask some artists milling about one day at the coffee shop what they knew about it. I received a vague point to the distance, in what turned out to be the exact opposite of its real location, and the first of many hushed, smirking intimations that many have said the cemetery and by extension the whole grounds is haunted. We found it aimlessly ambling the next day, on a hill couched between a busy street and an active construction site where dozens of rows of cement slabs laid hidden overgrown with grass and smashed by vandals. What is the point of such a place? What work of memory does it incite? 
With these questions in mind, we returned the next day to clear the brush and leave some flowers we took from the museum. We agreed that the patients resting in the dusty roadside garbage pit might enjoy the temporary beautification more than the tour groups hoping to satisfy whatever strange morbid itch drives people to survey rows of patients' brains and jars in the museum rather than pay their respects to the spirits of the deceased. Every place I visited had its own unique way of saying they didn't want to see or think about their troublesome, mad, and disabled outsiders. In Minnesota, if you can find a lunatic's graveyard, rarely a simple endeavor, you'll find few of the protruding slabs of granite, columns, and statues we've come to expect. Names were, administratively speaking, superfluous. Cylindrical cement markers cut in many cases using a tin can bear only a single number. At Hastings Asylum, hundreds of wooden crosses from earlier years burned in grass fires and will be lost forever. The Disability Self-Advocacy Group, remembering with dignity, based out of the Twin Cities, has worked to connect the lives of the overlooked, disabled, and psychiatrized of today with these silent stones by naming them. After years of research and lobbying the state for funding, the group managed to replace about half of the cement slabs with larger granite stones, labeled with names and dates penciled in decayed books long buried in the archives. Renewed vows to the dead and declarations of solidarity with those who saw little of it in life are made at annual dedication ceremonies. Their actions even prompted the state to make an apology in 2010, though a treacherous one, as it coincided with widespread cuts to disability services. The dead speak again, however faintly. Visiting these newly hallowed resting places puts one at unsteady ease. On one of the busiest streets in Minneapolis, Lake Street, there's a graveyard for pioneers and soldiers. The most notable thing about it to me for many years was the solitary deer that lived in this strange urban enclosure, grazed on apples and snacks pedestrians threw past the fence. It's there in the northeastern corner where the University of Minnesota laid 300 anonymous bodies used for anatomical research to rest in the early 20th century. The last stop was St. Joseph, Missouri in the fall. The State Lunatic Asylum No. 2 opened in St. Joseph in 1874 and would go on to incarcerate up to 3,000 unfortunates at any time. In the 1990s, the state of Missouri followed the direction already taken throughout much of the country of converting the largest cluster of asylum buildings into a prison, veterans housing, a hospital, or a school, and either destroying the rest or using them for a smaller psychiatric facility or museum. Apparently dissatisfied with just one of these options, St. Joseph decided to do as many as possible. Today, a prison surrounded by razor wire and circled every couple minutes by a guard's pickup truck stands shoulder to shoulder with the museum, which is just across the street from a psychiatric treatment center. As you park to visit the museum, you can see the prisoners milling about in the yard, no more than 50 feet away. Founded by a hospital worker who built life-size displays of psychiatric treatments in the 1970s, the Glore Psychiatric Museum Administration seems to have had multiple identity crises over the years. A clear glass display holding some 300 pins a patient ate hangs on the same wall that claims to show new neurological imaging of various mental disorders opposite a feminist critique of psychiatric diagnostics which is next to the room filled with vintage electroshock machines and straitjackets. They seem to want to say everything all at once. On leaving this wing, we found that this was more true than we could have imagined. Down the hall, nearly every room was host to its own specialized museum. Out of the door of the doll museum, decorated with about a hundred or so vintage Barbies, one could read a sign reading, and they were slaves from the black archives. Just a few doors down, past the record collection in the World War I exhibit, 4,000 various objects are proudly displayed as the, quote, Native American collector's items of Harry L. George. 
Baskets, pottery, and clothing are cramped close into formal categories that say nothing about the objects at hand. Out of this cacophony of desultory material chaotically displayed, a clear picture nevertheless develops. The collection claims ownership over the dead. It purports to authoritatively present their sufferings, their ideas, their social ties, even their deaths. The proximity of a native collection and a psychiatric museum is hardly a coincidence. The marriage of medical knowledge, hobbyist collecting, and the desecration of the dead in the Midwest ties the two in a sheet bend knot. In the wake of the Dakota War in southern Minnesota, 38 Dakota warriors were executed with President Lincoln's approval. Scrambling to the scene of the massacre was none other than William Worrell Mayo of the world-famous Mayo Clinic in Rochester who, along with the rest of his covert skeleton crew, pilfered as many Dakota bodies as he could. Mayo, however, was after one particular body, that of Mahbia Aka Najin, one who stands on a cloud. This warrior, called Cut Nose by Whites because he'd lost a portion of his nose in a hunt, had, according to the doctor, once threatened Mayo and tried to steal his horse. In his memoir, this was a heroic narrative of the just white man standing up to a drunk Indian, and now he had the opportunity to take his fated revenge. Dr. Mayo hung up his nemesis's skeleton in his office. It was by studying these bones, he wrote, that his two children, Charles and William, founders of the Mayo Clinic, learned human anatomy. In more ways than one, the medical profession in this country constructed its foundations out of the bodies of colonized and enslaved peoples, not to mention the disabled, the freaks, and the mad. Tao Yati Duta, better known as Little Crow, the chief of the Medewakantan Dakota, famous for hesitantly leading attacks during the war, shared his friend's posthumous fate. His death came when a white man shot him, knowing only that he was an Indian and therefore could be shot according to the recently passed scalping laws that made every white man a potential bounty hunter. When his corpse was positively identified, he was dragged into the small town of Hendrickson. The town held a jubilee while little boys and townspeople paraded his skull on a pike. In the end, they threw him to the pigs, but not before his scalp and skull were harvested by a local physician and sold to the historical society where they remained until the mid-20th century. A letter in the Historical Society's collection shows that portions of his body were later sold to an individual who placed them in a novelty watch. Over 100 years later, in 2017, the Walker Art Museum decided to feature a climbable artwork by the artist Sam Durant in their sculpture garden called Scaffold, based in part on the gallows used in the Dakota War executions. Once again, the sight of children playing at the sight or suggestion of native death was reenacted for pleasure and some dubious notion of insight. It is seldom possible in the States to differentiate between war crimes, scientific inquiry, art collection, and commodity sales. What is the point of burying the dead? of tending to a space that just happens to contain what used to be our friends, lovers, or family. Just about every recorded human community has treated their dead as more than mere flesh. West Africans brought to the US as slaves buried their dead with their bodies facing east so that the spirit might return to their homeland and be among their ancestors. Medieval Christians measured their posthumous blessings by how close to a saint they would be laid to rest in the churchyard in an interview with Dakota anthropologist Ella Deloria, a survivor of the Dakota War who returned to Minnesota said, We could not stay away because our makafahas, the Santee word for hills and graves, were here. Such acts and sentiments, no matter how small, in their refusal to treat the dead body like a heap of matter are practical acts of necromancy. They betray a belief in the power of the dead and they put them to work. 
even the most extreme acts to divest the body of its properties, as when the Nazis reduced their victims to dust and released it into the wind, reveal a belief in the power of the corpse and seek to annul it. Echoing the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, Karl Marx once advised his proletarian comrades that for the revolutionary struggle to move on, they must let the dead bury their dead. The dead will never allow this to happen. The dead work, produce, create. We speak languages inherited from the dead. We live in the worlds they built. We stand on their bones. The dead live on through us. We cannot live except through the dead. The dead move earth, sometimes dramatically, as when the rank mounds of the war vanquished or unnamed paupers buried quickly stretch so high towards the heavens they form new hills. The apocalyptic agents of manifest destiny moved some mountains with dynamite and gunpowder and left others of bone, flesh, and organ wherever they went. Mounds need not always be the product of the dumping of inconvenient cadavers. The burial mounds found along the Mississippi in St. Paul or in Bloomington, Minnesota, were carefully crafted with intention and respect. William Blake, for one, advised readers to drive your cart and your plow over the bones of the dead. If we are to move on as Marx and Jesus desired, we cannot just bury and turn our backs, but acknowledge that any new seeds are sown in a soil composed of friends and relatives. Whether with tender or brutal intent, the first work of the dead is the sedimentation of corpses that morphs the geology of the Tellurian surface we walk upon. The dead center and focus political memory. When Lincoln's body, preserved with the miraculous and novel embalming fluids of his century, was paraded through the ravaged post-war country by locomotive, it became the symbol of a nation. The display of his dead body was central to the patriotic strategy of a new, fragile, unified state. Tears and wild performances of affection made a banner out of mere flesh and bone, and, in so doing, solidified the triumphant image of a country out of a shattered wasteland. Lynching photography, that other nation-building work of the dead, conspicuously exploded in short order, ensuring that any new political era would still include terroristic white rule. A corpse can likewise, contra Marx, galvanize a radical politic, as in the Lichtenberg neighborhood in Berlin, where the Friedrichsfelde Central Cemetery served as a feared no-man's land for police after the massive funeral processions for the socialist Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg made their way through working-class districts in Berlin, some of which, like Friedrichshain, remain centers of rebellion to this day. The dead tell the truth. A medieval proverb says that they open the eyes of the living. They can't help but say everything. In Canton, South Dakota, the Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians operated as a special wing of the country's administration of the MAD being the only federal insane asylum designed to incarcerate the troublesome members of a specific racial group. Now it's mostly forgotten. The buildings are all gone, and the most popular texts on it still insist on apologizing for its existence, since it dealt with real medical problems, as opposed to the pure cultural and linguistic destruction of the industrial schools. Stone markers having been deemed too high in expense by a superintendent who never even bothered to learn any languages of his prisoners, the 121 who died confined in unheated cells were interred beneath a golf course. The small fence around the plaque is sometimes entered by golfers whose balls are mistakenly hit inside. Every year, native people trek hundreds of miles on horseback to honor their dead in Canton where they ride straight past the unholy town into the golf course to hold ceremonies, as they do in Mankato, the site of the mass execution. This annual ride is the sole true thing to be found in Canton. Skeletons demand to be recognized. They demand to have the truth told.
The dead tie people to the earth and to the relations they wish to cultivate. It's no coincidence that many of the political actions of the Red Power Movement in the 1960s and 70s centered on the treatment of the dead. In God is Red, Vine Deloria Jr. recounts a scene in Welsh, Minnesota, when members of the American Indian Movement disrupted an archaeology dig at an Indian burial site, forcing the academics to leave the dead to rest. The presence there, like the mounds along the river, stand as testament to the Dakota who didn't just inhabit the land before the settlers, but who still live here and fight to protect their ancestors from posthumous desecration. Actions like these ultimately led the way to NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, providing a legal route for reclaiming at least some of the remains of ancestors. The medieval French law of inheritance dictated that the dead seize the living, as in, they tether us to what is past. Without them, we are lost. Now, more than ever, the planet demands that great civilizations form new relations with the Earth, which requires, in turn, recommitments to the dead. Whether it's a scalp behind glass, in a museum, or a membrane flayed open by a scalpel, the involuntary manipulation of the dead body plants the triumphant flag of masculine dominance onto the bodies of the weak. Legions of human remains still haunt private collections awaiting their liberation in earth or ritual. The battle to return native remains and the bones of black slaves and paupers for proper treatment and burial continues. The skeleton of who stands on a cloud was passed on like a trophy for generations and only returned to the Santee Dakota in 2018, 156 years after it was stolen. As wondrous as they are, this is one labor the dead cannot perform. Capitalism has most successfully drained the dead of communal meaning by reducing them to a market value. Marx famously compared capitalism to vampirism, since it, like the winged Count Dracula of European folklore, can only persist by sucking dry the lifeblood of the living. Capitalism, however, has been equally successful at consuming the flesh and organs of the dead. It is therefore also a ghoul. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the burgeoning anatomy wings of the new medical schools consumed thousands of corpses a year in pursuit of admission into the medical profession and profitable research. They employed hundreds of working-class white grave diggers who were looking for more reliable sources of income, while others simply bought slaves to do their dirty work, as Grandison Harris was made to do in Georgia. Though we lack definite numbers, pictures of dissections and anecdotes of students and grave diggers alike tell us that whites were more comfortable when it was a black cadaver under scalpel. In Baltimore, the bodies of colored people exclusively are taken for dissection, wrote Harriet Martineau in 1835, because the whites do not like it, and the colored people cannot resist. In 1787 and 88, Black residents of New York City petitioned to stop gravediggers from desecrating the city's black graveyard and stealing bodies. When a nice white woman was mistakenly taken, mobs rioted and burned down the medical school. Gravediggers have become the odious villains of history, but it's the professors, the body traders, and ultimately capitalism itself that are the real ghouls. Capitalism, unlike Christianity, has resurrected the dead, but solely for a horrific second life in the market. Instead of redeeming the dead, the developers, city planners, and museum owners seek to extract even more profit from them. Bits and pieces of skulls, scalps, nails, hair, and skin from the laboratory or from lynching sites found their way into illicit markets as collector's items and protective relics. Today, the ghost hunters who stalk these places, in a clumsy attempt at connecting with the sufferings of the dead, hasten their conversion into tourist attractions. They distort and diminish that suffering and exploit it for thrills and the price of admission. We live, then, under the frightening aegis of ghoul capitalism and wretched necropolitical violence. The course of decomposition, understood purely biologically, is first construed as a bulwark to profit and scientifically manipulated to this end. 
A new class of professional body brokers has arisen to exploit a lax body donation system and harvest organs and skins for laboratories and procure corpses for the U.S. military to obliterate with its new toys before testing them on the living. Ghouls are caricatured as nothing more than a bizarre curiosity of the past, and yet the market in bodies is actually more lucrative than ever. The commodified undead cannot perform the communal work we need the dead to do, because they have not been allowed to fully skeletalize. I've trembled terribly in sadness my entire life. All too often I feel more at home with the breathless than with the quick. I no longer seek to be purified of this melancholy blue that envelops me. Now, I think that perhaps to tremble in this way is, as Edouard Glissant wrote, to tremble the trembling of the world. The corpse among corpses trembles with the vanquished and is responsible to them. The first necromantic task is to ensure that the skeletal community can begin its work. This may not always entail a burial, but simply could be, to borrow a beautiful phrase spoken by the protagonist of Bessie Head's novel A Question of Power when she placed her hands over the dirt, a gesture of belonging to the land that has always welcomed us and will consume our bodies in time. It's easy to lose sight of the profundity of this gift. I couldn't have guessed in my cemetery summer that a plague year would soon be upon us. Crematoriums are working double time, while pictures of bodies filling hotels or refrigerated trucks and the seemingly antiquated image of prisoners digging paupers' graves have fast become commonplace again in this country that inures us to every atrocity. The skeletal community grows by the day. Do you hear them? Their bones creak and rattle for closure, but not for each and every life lived. The passage of time already forbids this. But for the closure of an age with no reverence for earth, its dead, or the world they prepared for the living.